Hi guys, you want to get the most out of your ZV E10? Of course you do. Otherwise, why would you click on my stupid face? Well, I got some tips, tricks, and hacks coming up. Hey, how about this? I'm using one of them right now. Let's talk about it. So quick shout out to Vic Barry. He's got a great channel. He does a lot of Sony products, the uh, ZV E10 and the ZV1, especially streaming. Great with the streaming. But anyway, he did a bunch of tips that you can do with the ZV E10. And some of these are going to cross over with some of what he said. So, uh, you know, he got there first. So go over, give him some love. But after, after you watch this one, not before. What is the first hack? The one I alluded to in the intro. Well, I'll show you what it is right now more reach out of your lenses. This is the actual field of view of the lens that I've been using in the video the whole time up to this point. This is the 16 mil from Sigma, the F 1.4. It's my favorite lens for the APS-C lineup and my favorite lens for the Micro Four Thirds lineup. Anyway, doesn't matter. This is the lens that I am using, but it's too wide for this space. You can see my whole mess. You can see how, how terrible. But this, this is a microcosm of what's going on in my brain. It's just a mess of cords and apple juice cans. You don't, you don't need to see that. You need to see a more pristine, clear version. And the way I did it is using a feature that a lot of people think is a weakness of the little ZV E10, and that is stability. So I use the active stability mode on the camera and I still keep my little box, the little eye autofocus, because in active steady mode, the camera crops in about 40%. This turns my 16 mil lens into roughly about a 30, 32 millimeter lens, which is perfect for my space. And so when a lot of people were reviewing the camera initially, they were saying, oh, what's terrible with the active steady shot when you walk around, it crops in too far and it's too close for vlogging. But there are some circumstances where it's actually a benefit, like in this case, for instance, you can get so much extra reach with the active steady shot. Let's say you had a 50 millimeter lens and you want a bit more of a telephoto or you had an 85 millimeter lens and you wanted that bad boy to be an actual telephoto. You just can use the active steady shot and it crops in on the sensor and you don't lose any kind of resolution whatsoever. Hack. And my second point is more of an offshoot of the first point. So I'll call it point one B, and that is you can get even more reach out of your lens. That's right, folks, more reach using something called clear image zoom. I did a whole video about it that I am linking up here somehow, some way. Clear image zoom, it's a way for Sony to zoom in using advanced algorithms that looks absolutely fantastic. To my eye, I can't see any loss in quality whatsoever. Let's go for it right now. Oh, we're zooming in, baby. Look at this. 1.5 times. So now I just turned my 16 millimeter lens into a 32 millimeter lens with the active steady shot and now probably around a 50 to a 55 millimeter lens. So now you don't have to bring a ton of lenses on a shoot. This 16 millimeter lens pretty much has me covered and then maybe I'll bring a portrait lens too if I see some models in the park and I'm like, hey buddy, hey buddy, you look good on that skateboard. Okay, I need a little bokeh, you know? You gotta have a short telephoto for the bokeh boys on the skateboard, that was hard to say. So now let me show you where that is in the menu. So here we are in the menu. This is tab two, page three of nine, and you see steady shot here. You can turn it on active or you can turn it off. Now, if you have a lens that has image stabilization, you can pick the standard and the standard will just go with the image stabilization from the lens itself, but this lens doesn't have any stabilization, so that's why that's grayed out. And when you choose the standard stabilization, the lens one, you won't see any crop whatsoever because it's just from the lens itself. Now, an easier way to get to that is just when you're ready to record, you just press the function button, and then it's right there by default in the quick menu. You can turn it off or you can turn it on. You see that crop? This is the function menu button, the FN button right here. That's also helpful when you're in the menu, it can skip through the tabs if you press the function button. And now I'll show you where the clear image zoom. It is page five, six, six of nine. Page six of nine, 
I'm trying to remember from the last video I did. Page six of nine, there's clear image zoom. So there's optical zoom only, which means you will only use the zoom in your lens, clear image zoom, which is what I'm talking about, and then the digital zoom. Digital zoom will actually let you zoom in to four times in 4K, but the results I don't think are very good. I tested it out, and uh, digital zoom is as you would expect. The quality is quite degraded, but clear image zoom, on the other hand, no, sir. So I'll leave that on. Now watch this. So I'll zooming in, see that? Going into 1.345 times. Now you actually see it went up the two times instead of the 1.5 times I was talking about. Because 1.5 times is in 4K, but in 1080, you can get two times the reach. So even further reach in 1080, but I just don't use 1080. I'm using it for the demonstration, but normally I'm using 4K. On to tip hack number two, use HLG3. That will give you the best dynamic range for the camera in a way where you can color grade it without the image falling apart. If you try to use S-Log2 or S-Log3, you may have problems. S-Log2 seems to have problems with autofocusing and the image falling apart, and S-Log3 is almost a non-starter. The fact that the camera is 8-bit means that the S-Log footage is going to be tough to color grade. It's gonna fall apart pretty quickly, but the HLG, that will give you almost all the dynamic range the sensor can offer you in a way where when you color grade it, it won't fall apart. And if you don't know, dynamic range is just the difference between the dark parts of your scene and the bright parts of your scene. Let's say you're on a beach and there's some rocks and shadows and you wanna get those captured, but you got a nice blue sky. When you don't have a lot of dynamic range, you have to choose one or the other. Are you gonna expose for the shadows and the rocks or are you gonna expose for the sky. So if you have more dynamic range, you can capture more of the information of both those things. So I'll show you where I have that set up here. So you go to tab one down to picture profile, turn on picture profile 10, because that's already in HLG. Make sure it's in HLG three and uh, BT 2020. And I did a whole video about picture profiles and how that uh, if you're using Final Cut, you will need to do a color space override. You can see that in that video. If you're using DaVinci or uh, Premiere Pro, when you drag your HLG into the timeline, it will just automatically convert to Rec. 709. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it, watch that last video. But use HLG3 with BT2020 and that will give you the best dynamic range. Number three, use your memory recall buttons. This is really, really important for the ZV-E10 and the Sony cameras that have the same menu system because what happens is if you wanna switch between photos and video, not all of the settings get separated, which can be extremely annoying. Let's say I wanna shoot on HLG3 my for my picture profile for my video, but when I wanna switch to taking photos, I want picture profiles off, which, which I do. You get what I'm saying. I don't want those settings to switch over to video when I do it, but if you just go on the standard settings, that is exactly what will happen. However, the M1s are separate on the photo and the video side, and S and Q as well. Don't use S and Q, we'll talk about that in another tip. But the photos and the videos, M1s, are separate. So what I do is in photo, I set up the way I like to shoot my photos in M1, and then when I switch to video, then the settings don't transfer over. And in my video settings, in the M1, I do my slow motion settings. So now, at the click of a button, I go between my M1 photos into my video setting, which is my standard setting, and then my M1 for video is slow motion. So all of the three settings that I always use, they don't share settings anymore. Hack! I'll just show you quickly what I'm talking about here. Right now, you'll see my shutter speed is 1 over 50, f1.8, ISO 125. Now, if I switch over to my, I'll go into the quick function menu. I'm in the my movie mode right now. Switch to memory recall one. And now you'll see my shutter speed is one over 250. I'm still at F 1.8 and my ISO is at a thousand where I left it. The white balance is also different. So you see my regular movie mode and my M1 don't share settings. So now if I go over to my photo mode, you will see I am in memory recall one and uh, you will see that everything looks different here. I have auto white balance, auto ISO, no picture profile on. Pretty good, huh? So now I can just switch between the photo mode and the movie mode and they won't change settings. And when I switch the movie mode to slow motion on the, his M1, 
doesn't change settings. Next tip, don't use S and Q. Yes, I know it's one of the modes on the top. I wish there was a way to change it so that it could be something else because I use the photo mode and I use the movie mode, but when it comes to slow motion, the S and Q is not as good as the other slow motion the camera offers. Slow motion uh, with the S and Q is called slow and quick. And basically it uses a much lower data rate. And the higher the data rate, the better quality your footage is gonna be. So the S and Q is using a lower bit rate. Another problem is that it does the slow motion for you in camera. So if you set it to 120 frames per second, at 24p, then it just slows it down five times and you can actually watch it back on your camera, which is a bit of a benefit to be able to watch the slow motion while you have just recorded it. But when you get it back in post, that's it. Now it is slowed down, there is no audio. Whereas if you record slow motion in your regular settings, like where I set it, the memory recall one button in video, that will use a much higher bit rate, 100 megabits per second. So the quality is gonna be better. It's going to record my actual audio and it's going to record it so it you could just drop it on your 24p timeline and I could be talking like this but I could slow it down and then speed ramp it okay for example I'm recording this in 120 frames per second and I just stuck it on my 24p timeline so that you can hear me talk but I can also do things like this Isn't that cool? So I can speed ramp, I can slow it down, I can do whatever I want because I have that option in a higher bit rate, which gives me nicer footage. Yeah! Now you may have seen when I was doing the memory recall that there was an M1, M2, M3, but those things they have to be uh, recorded to the SD card. So when you format your SD card, they will disappear. So those aren't really much good to you. Really, it's just the one. Battery life. You can save battery life by going to the network tab. So tab three, page one of two, and you turn airplane mode on. Now that will cut off all of the Wi-Fi functions, the Bluetooth, sending it to your smartphone. So if you're using any of those devices, then you don't want to turn on the airplane mode. But often I am just using the camera on its own or with an external monitor. So I like to save that battery life by turning the airplane mode on. Now another way to save battery life is to turn the brightness down in the camera on the monitor here on the back screen. But the problem is the back screen's already not that bright and if you're outside, then it's gonna be very tough to see. So the fact is usually when I'm outside, I use sunny weather on the screen. So if you're in the studio, yes, you can save more battery life by turning the brightness of the monitor down. But the second you go outside, I would switch that thing to sunny weather because what's the point of saving battery life if you can't see a damn thing you're doing? Next tip, this one's a big one. Probably should have done it at the beginning of the video, whatever. You don't know me, just go to the toolbox tab there and I used to think that was a briefcase and then go down to the power setting option, auto power off temp, set that to high because if you set it to standard, then the camera is going to say it's too hot and it's going to shut down. And it's not too hot, it's just something that Sony has always done in their cameras. Some people say it's because they don't want people to get like a slow skin burn if they're holding a camera that gets hot because there doesn't seem to be any damage that can be done to the internals. I have always set my Sony cameras to high Everyone I know sets them to high. And when you set it to high, you don't even get an overheat warning. So just make sure you set the auto off temperature to high. Now this last one is use the My Menu setting in the Sony. A lot of people are confused by Sony menus, but as you get to know your camera very well, the quick function menu won't cover all of the things that you're looking for. So if you go into your My Menu, you can set the things you use the most in these uh, three pages of menus here. So right now I have the interval shoot function. That should have been another tip. That is a time lapse. In case you don't know, that's what Sony calls time lapses. Interval shoot funk. It, come on. 
And this one is format, because I'm always formatting my SDs, my Zebras, whether or not I want to turn airplane mode, the HDMI settings, quick access to that, touch operation. I didn't fill in the rest, because I've reset this camera a bunch of times, so I haven't had a chance to fill in all the menus. But look at this. You can have three menus of pages, so it's just as simple as you add item, say, oh, I use file format a lot. I'll just put that in here under the touch operation. Now it is added, and you see it right here. The My Menu thing is fantastic, because you don't have to go hunting through that very dense Sony menu when you're looking for just one little thing. Yeah, format the card, boom, boom, done. So I hope you found that useful. If the menus confused you, I did a whole video about going into the menus for the best video settings that you can get. So that's much more in depth. You can check that one out if you want. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. Mm -hmm.